The Dome Stadium has become a common choice in today's world of stadium construction. From the ability to control temperature, to taking weather out of the equation for games, domes offer much benefit, albeit at a higher cost. This was not always the case though, as it was not until more recently that they were even preferable to their outdoor counterparts, at least in most cities. This is the evolution of the Dome Stadium. Dome stadiums would not become a significant part of the early history of football or baseball, as it would not be until the 1960s that a regular indoor venue was built. Long before there was even a dome for either the NFL or MLB, an indoor football game would be played in a hockey arena in 1932 for the NFL championship of that season in Chicago. Attendance-wise for the time, it was a success. However, Chicago Stadium was a hockey arena, and it would show. Aside from the venue having a stench from a circus that had recently taken place there, the field was only 60 yards long, and no field goals could occur, and punts were nearly impossible. Needless to say, this was way before an indoor football game's time to shine. It wouldn't be until 1965 that the first regularly used domed NFL and MLB venue was finally built in the Houston Astrodome. For its time, it was fairly state-of-the-art with air conditioning and some natural light being let in. Slowly but surely, other cities would follow, with multiple dome stadiums being built in the 1970s. In the NFL, Texas would again build a dome, or at least try to. In 1971, Texas Stadium would open as the second dome, except this would only be a partial dome, as an attempt would be made at a retractable roof. This would never happen though, due to the technological limits of the day, and thus the hole was left open. The next pure domes would open in 1975, with the Silver Dome just outside of Detroit and the Super Dome in New Orleans. The Silver Dome would be the first NFL venue to feature a Teflon roof, which would be held up by air pressure. These types of domes would allow more natural light generally than seen previously. They would become popular throughout the 80s, with venues such as the Metrodome in 1982, the Hoosier Dome in 1984, and college football's the Carrier Dome in 1980. 1988 would finally see a successful attempt at a retractable roof, though a bad one. Olympic Stadium in Montreal, which had opened 12 years previously, had a retractable roof added in 1988, which would be controlled by cables pulling in and out of the tower above. This type of design was complicated and ahead of its time, and would be subject to many mechanical issues and eventually would just be replaced with a fixed roof. The first sustainable retractable roof at a full-size stadium would open in 1989 with Toronto's Skydome. This would be the first time nearly an entire indoor stadium could be exposed to the outdoors, as Olympic's retractable roof only covered a portion of its entire roof. Despite this new technology, more fixed roof stadiums would be built in the 90s, with the Florida Suncoast Dome in 1990, the Alamo Dome in 1993, and the TWA Dome in 1995. These three would kind of be a step back, as the Suncoast Dome, better known as Tropicana Field, would look like a giant circus tent while the Alamo and TWA domes were more like giant basketball arenas, providing no natural light. Up to this point, domes were pretty much just built out of necessity rather than preferability. It wasn't really ideal for colder markets such as Minnesota and Montreal to play outdoors if they didn't have to, nor would it make sense for the hotter ones such as San Antonio and Tampa. Up to this point, domes were generally dark, subject to leaks, and AstroTurf playing surfaces were generally poor. It wouldn't be until 1998 when Chase Field would open in Arizona that a more modernized, retractable roof stadium would be built to a more sports-specific shape and design, as the Sky Dome was more multi-purpose, and this stadium would have real grass, along with retractable paneling being able to open parts of the sides. It would provide a better proof of concept for dome baseball stadiums, and similar ones in Houston and Milwaukee would open a few years later. In 1999, Seattle would open something completely different, with Safeco Field having just a retractable roof, yet being open on the sides to the elements. As for the NFL, it wouldn't be until 2002, with Houston's Reliance Stadium, that retractables would be part of the league's venues. It would be from this point forward that domes could be just as good, if not better than their outdoor counterparts. The advent of field turf in this era would make playing surfaces much improved in domes as well. Also in 2002, Ford Field would open in Detroit, incorporating an old warehouse into its design, mixing modern and historical design elements while allowing for some natural light. 2006 would see the first dome with a movable natural playing surface in University of Phoenix Stadium. However, it would be in 2009 when everything changed. 
Cowboy Stadium would open during this year, and its size, scoreboard, atmosphere, and amenities would set not only a new standard for domes and stadiums in general, but also begin the era of the $1 billion plus dome in the NFL. Over were the days of just building an indoor venue to keep the weather out. Now it was about creating an experience. The domes built since would even be further improved in certain ways, with translucent roofing in US Bank, Allegiant, and SoFi stadiums, which could protect fans from the sun, while also letting more of it in than ever before. Today the dome stadium has almost become a go-to option, despite the fact that they cost a lot more up front, just simply based on the fact that it can host so many more events throughout the year. It appears that in the future, many cities that once had outdoor venues may have dome stadiums as their next venues of choice. Time will tell. However, the evolution of the dome stadium has come a very long way. Thank you for watching.